This video is a follow-up to my previous one about Outer Wilds. I'd recommend watching that video before this one, because I'll be expanding on some of the ideas I mentioned in it, as well as making comparisons between base game and DLC. I also need to put another big, in-your-face spoiler warning here, because once again, Echoes of the Eye is an experience that really deserves to be played as blind as possible. For those indecisive, or just looking for a quick overview, however, I'll keep the intro spoiler-free just like last time. In many ways, Echoes is as worthy a successor to Outer Wilds as we could have hoped for. Its puzzles and story are driven by that same spirit of curiosity and discovery, with comparable moments of spectacle and awe-inspiring terror. Certain parts in the first half took my breath away, as my mind scrambled to make sense of the new places and scenarios I found myself in. The content of Echoes is completely segregated from the base game, and it takes place in a completely separate location, so you more or less start from scratch with a new environment to explore and traverse, to discover a new story tangentially related to the tale of the Nomai from the base game. That sense of exploring and discovering new things was the real heart of Outer Wilds, so it was truly great to feel that again in the first half of Echoes. It's in the second half that things get a little bit different, with a new addition to the Outer Wilds formula that's made the latter segments of the DL Squeakwall a bit more divisive among players. That new addition is a horror element, which, depending on how you approach it, can end up making Echoes feel like a very different experience to the Outer Wilds you're used to. I don't want to get too bogged down here on the difference between horror and terror, there's plenty of time for that later, but suffice to say that there are scares in Echoes that go well beyond the kind of creeping dread that was present in the base game. When first booting the game after installing the DLC, you even get a warning about its more frightening elements, along with the option to turn them off if you're so inclined. Asking the player to make a decision like this before they even know what they're deciding is always questionable, but in this case I think it's mostly there to make you aware that you have the choice to turn them off later. I should point out before moving on that, in response to common problems players were having with certain puzzles, post-release patches have changed some of the design of the DLC quite drastically in some cases, which presents me with a kind of dilemma. Should I analyse the game as it was when I first played it at release, in order to talk about my first playthrough, which in a game like this is the only playthrough that really matters, or should I analyse the game as it is now, as it will presumably remain for the rest of its life, and as most people watching this video in the future will play it? I recorded my footage of Echoes after the patches had been released, so I won't be showing the specific differences but I'll bring them up when I get to them and explain what effect the changes have had. If nothing else, it should make for an interesting study in how design flaws can be fixed by changing certain elements. If you're a fan of Outer Wilds and somehow haven't played Echoes yet, it carries enough of the spark of the original that, on the whole, you shouldn't be left disappointed, so this is your final spoiler warning. Pause this video here and come back when you've finished it. While my Outer Wilds video was split into parts about the different elements of the game's design, for Echoes I'll be going through a playthrough, drawing comparisons and commenting on the design as we go, with a summary of the DLC as a whole at the end. With all that said, let's get into it. When you first start playing after installing Echoes of the Eye, the game begins exactly the same way it always has before, with a new time loop on Timber Hearth. But if you head to the observatory, you'll find a new exhibit showcasing the Deep Space program and its radio tower. Heading over to the tower elsewhere on Timber Hearth, you find some deep space photography of the solar system, with a strange anomaly blocking the sun in one of the pictures taken from a certain angle. Naturally, you head for the satellite and follow along until it reaches that position again, and you see for yourself that strange anomaly. With the light blocking entity in your sights, you head towards it and its relative size grows as you do so, until it blocks out the sun. The realisation that you're heading straight into something enormous and unknown is a terrifying one in the true sense of the word. The wonder and terror I felt at this moment had me giddy with excitement to see the rest of the DLC, and I remembered just how much I had missed playing Outer Wilds. When you draw close enough to it, the outside world is entirely blocked out, leaving you in a void in front of a huge space station with seemingly only one docking space to land in. Leaving your ship and heading through the only entrance, you spot these glyphs, and being unable to translate or recognise them, have to conclude that the structure you're standing on isn't Nomai in origin. In a neatly designed bit of self-teaching, you learn that these green orbs are light activated when you enter this dark chamber and switch on your torch inadvertently starting the airlock mechanism and opening the opposite door. 
Entering the next room, your light will activate these orbs and confirm the lesson you've just learned, though they don't seem to do anything just yet. When you press the switch at the side of this contraption though, the floor falls away with you on it, and Echoes of the Eye really begins in earnest. The shock of falling and trying to reorient yourself, realising that you're moving along a river, then looking down that river and realising it curves upwards, then realising that you're inside a gigantic cylindrical space station, all contributes to an incredibly strong opening that blew me away the first time I saw it. The experience filled me with the same sense of wonder I felt at the original game, and I was ready right then and there to say they'd done it again and created another masterpiece. Floating down the river, you should notice that those light-activated orbs control which direction your raft moves, and guiding yourself into this dock, you get a chance to step onto dry land and take a look at your new environment. And it's here that the linear opening of Echoes ends, and the open-ended progression that Outer Wilds is known for begins. There are four major landmarks around the habitat, named the Stranger by your ship's log, a series of cabins in the river lowlands, a large tower and other buildings set into some islands, a collection of buildings and walkways crossing a chasm over the river, and a reservoir held back by a huge dam that spans the width of the cylinder. These landmarks are all connected by a river that flows around the stranger, splitting and breaking into different routes, carrying rafts and other debris with it. It's using this river that you spend most of your time traversing the stranger. It is possible to jetpack around using the land at the edges of the cylinder, but it's much slower and more laborious due to the higher than average gravity. Floating along the river is generally pretty enjoyable during these early stages of Echoes, when you're still seeing everything for the first time, and the fact that you have to make multiple passes in order to see the different routes along the river means that you have to put a bit of thought into choosing which way you go. Thanks to the shape of the habitat, you can look up from any spot and see every other location, which, as well as being a suitably impressive spectacle, is actually necessary for finding your way to the cliffside settlement. Having to look up, choose a destination and plan your route, then follow through on it, is a great navigational challenge, the kind of which I praised Outer Wilds for in my last video. While it's technically true that you can explore the landmarks of the stranger in any order you like, the river's direction of flow and the fact that the entrance to the habitat is near the base of the dam all but forces you into seeing things in a certain order or at the very least dictates which order you get a first look at the locations. Exploring those locations on foot for clues and information is much the same as in the base game, but with a bit of a difference in presentation. Since you're unable to translate the alien language written on signs and entrances, it's fortunate that the race that built the stranger kept most of their records in the form of picture slideshows, and the majority of the story in Echoes is told through those slideshows. Unfortunately for you, on many of the reels you can find, certain slides have been burned, leaving you with only part of the story. From what you're able to piece together however, it's clear that the race responsible for building the Stranger detected the signal of the Eye of the Universe from their homeworld, constructed the Stranger and came to investigate. So far, so Nomai. When they arrived and determined that the Eye's purpose was to end the universe so that a new one could be born, they were horrified and burned down their shrine to the Eye. Homesick for the world they left behind, they gather around a fire and go to sleep, each holding a lantern bearing a green flame. When you find a slide reel demonstrating the way into their hiding places, going to investigate will reveal a tomb of desiccated corpses, each still holding its lantern in a withered hand. Finding this for the first time is an unnerving experience to say the least. The Nomai from the base game were never seen outside of their spacesuits, so they always felt just a little bit abstract and impersonal. When stumbling upon the grotesque display in these hidden chambers, however, it's hard not to feel like you're in the presence of beings that could open their eyes and look back. By the time you've got to this point, you've probably been through more than one time loop, which means you've had to make your way to the stranger from Timber Hearth more than once. The first time you come back here after dying or running out of time on the stranger, the NPC sharing your campfire stops you before you leave, and reminds you that you can use your ship's log to mark points of interest, not so subtly hinting that you can use this to get to the stranger without having to go through the whole satellite thing every time. Looking back over the DLC now, I'm shocked that this made it into the final release, since it's the least Outer Wildsy bit of design I can possibly imagine. Outer Wilds is a game that deliberately gives almost nothing to the player for free, asking them to use their own curiosity to find shortcuts and solutions for themselves, 
and yet right here at the start of Echoes, you have an NPC just flat out telling you what to do. I know that part of the stranger's story is that it's cloaked and completely invisible from the outside, but surely, surely there was a better way for the player to find their way back there quickly without just getting an NPC to tell you to turn on a marker for it. Anyway, sooner or later in your explorations, you'll come across a slide reel telling you of a hull breach in the outside wall of the stranger. Heading there to check it out for yourself gets you inside the laboratory in the cliffside settlement, whose door is locked from the inside. You can find remnants of experiments with these lantern artifacts. One that does nothing, one that explodes, which is what caused the hull breach, and one that appears to succeed, though you're not sure yet what exactly it succeeds at. Also, side note, but the slides show nature of the visions you see of these experiments make them look remarkably like the fixed perspective viewpoints of mist. Coincidence? Who knows? By now you should have enough information to test out the experiments with the green fire for yourself. Grabbing a lantern and heading down to one of the hidden chambers housing the corpses, you fall asleep in front of the fire and awake to find all of the bodies missing. Another spooky moment. Heading back upstairs, you'll soon realise that you're somehow in a completely different place, and without your jetpack. Each of the fires in the three corpse rooms takes you to a different location, all connected by an on-rails raft system controlled by a light-sensitive orb and summoned by these lantern-activated totems. Here you might choose to spend some time exploring these strange new areas, each of which seems to be an analogue to a location on the stranger. There's a cabin in a swamp, a tower next to a village with a well in its centre, and a cliffside dwelling. It's in these areas that the terror at being somewhere you're not supposed to be starts to build, and it's only a matter of time before you realise that you're not alone. In the village by the well, you can hear the footsteps of beings on the floor above you. At the cliffside dwelling, you can see the silhouette of a being watching a slideshow, and you can even interrupt them by shining your light on it. But it's in the swamp by the cabin that Echoes of the Eye takes its first tentative step from terror to horror. As you follow the eerie music towards the cabin, you can see a procession of lights heading through the swamp. When you get closer to shine your own light on it and see what it is, you will get the fright of your life and a rude awakening to boot. Needless to say, the shock of discovering that these beings are still alive in some way, that they can interact with you, and that they don't like you, means that this is seriously fucking scary the first time it happens to you. Emphasis on first time, but we'll get to that. For now though, it seems there isn't really anything further we can do in any of the three dream worlds we've been to. Underneath the reservoir however, in this underwater vault there's a fourth fire we can snooze at, which will take us down to yet another dream area, with a triple locked coffin sarcophagus thing, and three control panels that will presumably let you unlock it. Each control panel needs a code, which naturally you don't know yet. It has to be said that asking the player to learn a code and input it somewhere else is pretty much the most uninspired knowledge-based puzzle there is, so I was a little disappointed to see it reused no less than five times across Echoes of the Eye. Nevertheless, the wheels are probably turning in your head at this point. Three control panels, three unknown codes, three dream environments. It ain't rocket science. If you try to open the coffin, it will strain against its bindings and reveal a vision to you that shows the way through a hidden door in the tower in the real world. Solving this puzzle requires you to understand that murals featuring the ringed planet will open when there are no light sources around, which you should already know from accessing the tombs. It requires an additional leap in logic, however, to realise that the lamps in this room are connected to the candles at the same spot in the dream world. This is one of the puzzles that was changed in a post-launch patch, in order to make that connection between the real and the dream world more obvious. The devs even did a survey on the Outer Worlds Reddit page to see what part of it was giving people trouble. Perhaps the reason it was felt necessary to do that is because this puzzle is also a bottleneck in the game's progression, that keeps most of the second act of Echoes behind it. I have some thoughts on this, but I'll keep them until the end when I go over the DLC's design as a whole. Heading down to the base of the tower through that secret doorway, you find plaques with the codes for all of the control panels on the stranger, but the three you actually want have been burned away. Better look next time. Thankfully, another code down here that hasn't been burned can be used to get access to the hidden basement underneath the temple, which gets you out of this bottleneck in the DLC's progression and sets you on a path towards the endgame. 
This basement gives you three clues to secret locations throughout The Stranger, each one a picture of a concealed area that was hiding in plain sight the whole time. Also in this basement is a slide reel that shows these nasty bird boys gathering all their records, putting them through some unknown machine, and then burning them, which explains the state you find them in. Following the three clues leads you to the three rooms where this burning took place, one in each location on The Stranger, and each one contains a slide reel showing the way to access yet another secret area in each of the three dream world spaces. The three burning rooms are pretty cleverly hidden. One is behind some overgrown trees that don't draw your attention at all until you know what you're looking for. The one in the cliffside settlement sticks out from this building in a way that looks obvious in hindsight, but you're unlikely to stumble into it by accident. Firstly because you're not likely to send the lift down without being in it, but even if you did happen to do that by accident, a casual glance down the shaft would keep the hidden door concealed behind a jutting out piece of floor. Very sneaky. As for the third slide burning room, I actually did discover it on my own when I spotted the only bit of non-running water from a distance and went to check it out. This was before I even knew about the dream world, so the contents of the reel made no sense to me whatsoever and didn't really ruin anything, although it did mean that I had less to do when I reached this end game slide hunt. Thinking about it, there's surprisingly little of the DLC left to go at this point, considering that this final part accounts for probably around half of my playtime, and not coincidentally, it also makes up the most controversial section of Echoes. All you need to do now is go into each of the dream worlds and access the secret areas as seen in the hidden slides. Problem is, in two of those dream worlds, turning off the lights in order to make your way to those secret areas will get the attention of every bird boy in the vicinity meaning you'll need to stealth your way through the place to get to your destination. In the third dream world, they're already up and wandering about, as we saw earlier. And just like I said back then, the first time you find yourself in this scenario, it truly is a frightening thing, especially when you have no idea what's going to happen to you if you get caught. Sooner or later though, you'll learn that being grabbed just kicks you out of the dream and back to the real world, where you can go right back to sleep if you want another try. And just like that, without any warning, Echoes of the Eye has made a sudden transition into a stealth horror game, which means that now is as good a time as any to get into the difference between horror and terror. Terror is a kind of philosophical fear that can't really be rationalised and explained away. After all, it really is an undeniable fact that we don't know everything, and there are unknown unknowns out there. Like Copernicus revealing that the planets revolve around the sun and not the earth, a paradigm shift in knowledge can have the power to utterly destroy everything we think we know about the universe. This is the kind of mind-shattering fear that HP Don't Google His Cat Lovecraft tapped into with his short stories. The fear of things we don't know yet, or of things that we may never be able to know. It's also the kind of fear that Outer Wilds tapped into, dropping you into an indifferent clockwork universe that doesn't care what you do or where you go. That planet will collapse, that city will be filled with sand, that star will explode. The universe doesn't care if you're in the middle of something when it happens. The eye of the universe ultimately represents some monolithic, inscrutable force that's impossible for us to fathom. It just is, and there's a natural terror that arises from grappling with the unknown. Horror, on the other hand, is a more mortal fear. Horror is a caveman afraid of being bitten by the beasts that prowl outside the range of his fire. Most horror games tend to revolve around gore or the threat of bodily harm, and that certainly can be scary. Trying to make it back to a save point in Resident Evil with a sliver of health left is proof enough of that. But it's a kind of pulse quickening fear, an evolutionary response to a perceived danger, just like that caveman by his fire. Spend enough time in any horror game though, and you'll sooner or later become desensitised to this effect, as over many deaths and continues, you become accustomed to the fact that you're not really in any danger. Many modern horror games lean into this fact, and wisely pivot to become more action-focused by the end. Horror prompts a fight-or-flight response that wears away over time, whereas there's no running away from an existential terror that's wormed its way into your mind. It's the difference between a fear of the unknown and a fear of a known entity that will nevertheless still cause you harm. Being scared because you're flying straight into something that blocks out the sun, in some way as yet unknown to you, is terror. 
being scared of a bogey monster that's going to eat you, or just kick you out of its simulated reality by blowing out your lantern, is horror. Hopefully you can see what I'm getting at here. There's a qualitative difference between these two different sources of fear. I'll refrain from making a value judgement of one over the other, because it's really a matter of opinion. But what can't be argued is that Outer Wilds usually deals in terror, and it does it perhaps better than any other game I've played. So, is it really any wonder that so many fans were disappointed by the pivot to horror for the last mile of the DLC? Add to this the fact that these sections take away your jetpack and force you to walk slowly around, and it's understandable that they caused frustration in players. The developers were clearly conscious of the critical response to these horror sections, and it's here that the biggest changes have been made by post-release patches. In the Endless Canyon, the Dreamworld version of the cliffside dwelling, sneaking to the secret area used to be much harder because of a more restrictive level design that meant fewer options for getting around the enemies. The Starlit Cove is a similar story, with the level design being changed and fewer enemies placed in the music hall at the base of the well. At release, Sneaking around these guys was a tedious affair because you knew that getting caught would throw you back out to the real world, and trying the same section again and again until you get it right isn't really what Outer Wilds is supposed to be about. You would end up stuck in a loop within a loop, as you played the same thing over and over while the wider time loop continued to pass, until the supernova occurred and you had to start all over again. It's true that dying in the base game would set you back as well, but it never asked for much skill from the player in terms of execution, which meant that most tricky or tense sections could be completed on the first or second try, keeping the game focused on exploration and puzzle solving. For most puzzles, there's just one solution, and it's plain to see whether you're doing the right thing or not. For stealth sections with more nebulous failure states, like those at the end of Echoes, however, you can't be quite sure whether you're doing the wrong thing entirely, or just getting the execution wrong and nowhere was this more apparent than in the third Dreamworld location, the Shrouded Woodlands. There are a couple of things that went into this area being way more misleading than the other two. First off, since both of the other dream spaces are completed by the use of stealth, it's only natural that the player would assume the same needs to be done here. From the slide reel you found earlier, you know that the secret area is behind the fireplace in the cabin, but when you get inside, you always find a room full of bird boys that catch you before you can get past. At release, the one standing in front of the fireplace was facing away from you, which made it seem like stealth was an option here. You were also able to stand in the middle of the room without getting grabbed for some reason, which heightened the confusion and caused me to spend literally hours trying to figure out how I was supposed to get past, from dashing by quickly to walking around the side door pretending to be one of them. Trained by the other two dream sequences, I naturally assumed that this was a problem with my execution, rather than the completely wrong approach that it actually was, causing me to try it over and over again until I finally just gave up and looked for a hint online, which I hate doing, but I really felt I'd tried everything. It turns out that the solution is to wait for the dam's collapse on the stranger to extinguish the flame keeping these birdos in the dream world then navigate here from another flame, using the rafts, and go through the fireplace in an empty cabin. While I appreciate this as a puzzle now that I know the solution, I wish the other two dreamscapes had something like this to solve, rather than just being uninspired stealth sections, especially because they didn't prepare me at all to approach this scene as a puzzle. My strongest memory of this section is not one of fear, but one of frustration. Enough players had a problem with this to cause the devs to turn this guy around in a patch, so that it's more obvious you can't stealth your way through. It's impossible for me to say what kind of a difference this change has made, since of course I already learned the solution the hard way, but I think I can say that the original puzzle here was an unfortunate failure in design. And the fact that it sticks out in contrast to the other dream worlds means that it remains a kind of odd one out even after the patch. I'm sorry to pile onto this one particular puzzle so hard, but another thing contributing to its obtuseness is the fact that the time loop as a whole is pretty underutilised in Echoes, which is why I've been able to get so far into this video without bringing it up. There are a few changes that occur on the stranger over the course of the loop, but honestly I don't think a whole lot was done with it. This puzzle in the Dreamworld cabin is the only one that requires specific timing to solve. Near the beginning of the loop, the solar sails open up, and the stranger begins moving away from the sun, an automated response meant to move the ship outside the area that will be affected by the supernova. The structural pressures produced by movement after so many millennia of being stationary cause the dam to start leaking, 
and around two-thirds into the time loop, the dam bursts, sending a rushing wave of water around the stranger that destroys and submerges most of the buildings it contacts, as well as extinguishing the green fires that grant access to the dream world. The tower is the only structure that survives this initial wave, although it does lean to one side and eventually collapses into the river just before the end of the loop, which is no coincidence. It's timed this way so that you can't use the same solution as in the cabin to avoid doing the stealth section in the tower dream world, which honestly, I think is some bullshit, and it only serves to make the solution to the cabin puzzle that much harder to discover on your own. Also, slight aside, but with the stranger moving out of the range of the supernova by the end of the time loop, each loop ends with your consciousness just fading out, which is pretty underwhelming when compared to being swallowed by a star. So after all that, what hidden truths were important enough to be stored away in these secret areas in the dream world? Each one leads down to a slide reel archive that contains the full version of the reels that had burned slides in the real world and through these you learn the complete history of the stranger and its inhabitants, which I'll summarise shortly when I get to the ending. Also in these archives are plaques containing the codes we need to unlock that coffin in the vault, except once again they've been scrubbed, along with our last hope of using them to get into the coffin. One other curious thing can be found in these archives however. Each one has a slide reel showcasing a bug report of a different glitch present in the dream world. And if you haven't figured out yet that the dream world is actually a mind uploading virtual reality, then you have now. The three bugs in question are as follows. If you drop your lantern and move too far away from it, you can see the matrix along with pathways usually invisible. You can jump off the raft while it's in the loading zone between different areas to end up where you're not supposed to be. And dying in real life as you enter the simulation means that you can no longer be woken up by the alarm bells going off because you're dead. That's why these corpses have been dead for many thousands of years, but their owners still exist in the simulation. Now you might be thinking that discovering these glitches would open the virtual worlds up to further exploration or exploitation, but no, you're basically done with the virtual spaces now. But surely, I hear you protest, these glitches could be used as an alternative way of bypassing the stealth sections if you don't like doing them. Well, that's technically right, but realistically wrong. The glitch about dying to avoid being woken up by bells is learned in the secret area that requires you to get past some bells, so that doesn't work. Same goes for the glitch about dropping your lantern to see through the matrix. Maybe some players discovered these glitches for themselves through experimentation and were able to use them to skip the horror sections of the game, but I think it's safe to say that it's not the intended solution for the first time through, meaning that there's no realistic way to avoid doing these stealth sections. It also means that there's no real purpose to exploring the virtual worlds again once you know about the glitches, outside of looking for easter eggs, or just to see them in a new light once you know about dropping your lantern. Admittedly, this is worth doing because it can be quite fun, but it would have been nice to see some kind of reward or consequence for doing this that actually affected gameplay. I should also say that there is some variability in which order you discover the three glitches in this last mile of echoes. Navigation in the virtual world might get slightly easier if you find the matrix glitch first because it gives you much better visibility, but as I said before I don't think there are any meaningful differences to gameplay that come from using it. So what's the real point of these bugs? Well when you make use of them in the virtual world of the underwater vault, you're able to bypass entering the codes and unlock the bindings on the coffin, allowing you to enter and see the ending. I enjoyed the revelation that these codes were red herrings all along, it was a great bit of misdirection that made up for the disappointment I felt earlier on first seeing these three control panels. Heading down into the coffin, we meet the only resident of the stranger that isn't angry to see you, and using this vision stick thing we learn their story. Combined with the complete slide reels from the virtual archives, we now know the full history of the stranger and its inhabitants. It turns out that when they detected the signal of the Eye of the Universe, they deforested and tore apart their home moon in order to build the Stranger and come to the Herthian solar system. When they discovered the terrible purpose of the Eye, they built a device to block the signal and make sure nobody else would find it. Distraught at the loss of their homeworld for the sake of this failed expedition, they developed a virtual reality to recreate their lost home and settled in to spend eternity nestled in its comforting lie. 
One of their number, known only as the Prisoner, had second thoughts about what they'd done to the eye signal, and left the simulation to go and deactivate the blocking device. Shortly thereafter, the others found and locked the Prisoner away in the vault to spend eternity in a virtual prison. They reactivated the device, and destroyed the machine that would turn it off again, blocking the signal of the eye for good. This explains why the Nomai detected the eye from afar, and then couldn't find it once they arrived in the Herthian system. This is also the moment when the inhabitants of the Stranger chose to double down on their decision, burning their slide reels to hide the evidence of the sacrifice they made in vain to get here, but not before digitizing them with these machines, which is how we're able to eventually see the full versions in the virtual archives. They also went to the length of destroying the codes that would be needed to end the prisoner's eternal solitude, which I think is an excessively cruel line to cross that makes me lose some sympathy for them. Just look at these evil bastards. Anyway, the prisoner leaves the coffin, and when we follow, we find footprints leading into the water and a final vision saying goodbye. And that's the end. These footprints were patched in later, so at release, this moment felt even more ambiguous in a way that really didn't work. Ambiguity can work in a book or a film, but in an interactive medium, and especially in a game that gives the players so much freedom and expects a certain amount of curiosity from them, it doesn't work at all. The player is left thinking that maybe they just need to do something else to trigger the next scene, but in reality you're done. If the devs had found some way to make the loop end here, then it could have gone some way to clearing up this confusion. Either way, I can't help but feel that the ending of the DLC is a little underwhelming when looked at as a piece of self-contained content. If you consider the game and DLC together from the perspective of someone playing both for the first time, however, I think it would just about work as a side story. I'm curious what it would be like to play Outer Wilds for the first time with the DLC installed, and have the ability to explore both the tales of the Nomai and the Stranger at the same time. But I think the fact that the content of the DLC is so completely segregated from that of the base game would leave players in no doubt that they're separate stories. And that's it for Echoes of the Eye. I covered many of my thoughts on its design as I went along, but I want to do a quick comparison to see how it stacks up to Outer Wilds on the whole before I wrap things up. In terms of progression, Echoes mostly follows the general theme of Outer Wilds in terms of knowledge being the thing that propels you forward, but in structure, it's far more linear and restrictive, with several bottlenecks that every player has to go through in the same order. While the smaller scope of the DLC might be justified, you can see a real linearity that wasn't present in the base game. Story revelations are similarly linear, and the way that they're told through slide reels feels more restrictive than the text of the Nomai, which could feasibly be found scrawled on any surface, and could also tell you something by the location you found them in. The Stranger's reels, on the other hand, are all clearly labelled by their first slides, and are just laborious enough to read through that the developers would have had to be conscious not to include too many, so you don't need to do very much work to piece together their story. Given that the Stranger's inhabitants do have a written language, it stretches believability just a little bit that they seem to barely ever use it. I wonder if some kind of gradual translation mechanic could have worked here, similar to the one featured in Heaven's Vault, although that might be asking for too radical a design change. Either way, comparing the storytelling methods of Outer Wilds and Echoes doesn't come out favourably for the DLC in my opinion. It's a similar situation with Traversal, which is far more restricted in Echoes. Your jetpack is useful for navigating around the locations on the Stranger, but getting between them more or less necessitates jumping on a raft. I guess this is fair enough since it's unique to the DLC and deserves to get some mileage, but I would have liked to see a bit more variety in its use. The first time around is exciting, but drifting down the same bit of river over and over again can get a little bit old. Also. This is a minor thing, but the music that starts playing when you're on a raft always ends just as suddenly when you get off it. This means you hear the first 20 seconds of it over and over again, which is a shame because the whole thing is great. Maybe having a few different versions of this track would have alleviated this. The immersive principles that made Outer Wilds so engrossing are still technically followed in Echoes, but when you find yourself stuck in that horror game loop of failing and retrying again and again, it's hard not to get frustrated and lose your immersion not to mention no longer finding it scary. Outer Wilds is a game where making progress is almost never about skill, it's about discovery and using new knowledge to do things you couldn't before. 
The stealth segments of Echoes feel more than a little out of place because of this, and they grind against the design philosophy that made the original game so unique. In my previous video I said that one of the biggest joys of Outer Wilds came from discussing and comparing your experience with other players, and while that's largely true in Echoes as well, the more linear structure of the DLC means that most first playthroughs are going to look fairly similar. While there are a few moments where unpredictable things can happen, mostly generated by the dam bursting or the AI behaviour of the bird boys in the virtual world, there's nothing comparable to the freeform exploration and progression that was present in the base game. Due to this, I think it's fair to call Echoes a story-focused expansion, and most players will have a broadly similar experience as they go through the DLC's twists and turns in a largely predetermined order in stark contrast to the freedom afforded by the base game. Shortcomings and differences aside though, Echoes of the Eye is a worthy DLC that any fan of the original owes it to themselves to experience, as we wait patiently for something on a bigger scale that can fill the void left by Outer Wilds.